Welcome everyone to the FPAR spring meeting in virtual form, given the unusual circumstances that we are all in and working from home. Uh, obviously, it just makes it a little more challenging than an in-person meeting that we would have had uh, in Washington, D.C. at this time. Uh, so please uh, try to work with us here to make this a, a good meeting. And uh, it will be recorded for that matter, but we have to also adjust the agenda. It's not as big as the earlier agenda that you have seen leading up to uh, this meeting because we needed to accommodate really four time zones from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast plus Alaska to make sure we can fit this in and therefore had to modify the agenda. So it is a shortened version and the full day that we had planned for reviewing aviation weather uh, activities across the federal agencies that was essentially moved down for next spring and hopefully we can do that then in person again in Washington DC. So this is a, a, uh, a shortened version of, of the uh, agenda for today's meeting. So Matt, if you click one more time, that will uh, just to give you a little bit of the rules of engagement, how we want to try to make this work in virtual form please mute, mute your microphones unless you're speaking. And in terms of speaking, if you have questions, it, it will be difficult if you just speak up because we may not know who is speaking. So if you actually submit questions or comments that you have through the Microsoft Team chat capability, if you hover with your mouse on the screen, then you see a box coming up <clears throat> and at the bottom there is a, a, a show conversation that you can click on which opens a chat room where you can type in a question or a comment and we will have someone monitor that so that we can pick up uh, anything that will happen and, and, and speak up on your behalf. And Matthias, that will be Dave Strand. Um, my MITRE colleague Dave Strand will be monitoring the chat room and when we get into Q&A, we'll basically run it through Dave at that point. OK, sounds good. Thanks for chiming in, Matt. And can you click one more time? So this is just showing a very abbreviated version of today's uh, schedule. We will have a wonderful keynote address to start us off uh, by our uh, FAA Administrator, Captain Steve Dixon, and Mike Franzak, uh, Matt Franzak will introduce him in a moment. And then we will uh, focus on weather reporting in the national airspace system, current and future needs. This is a session that was put together by Gordy Rother, John Stevenson, and uh, Tom Ryan. And this will uh, occupy most of the day. There will really be three segments with breaks in between. And then towards the end of the day, we'll have an update of ADSB weather uh, capabilities by Steve Dar. And uh, Matt and I will wrap it up uh, late today uh, on FPA updates to the extent that we still have time. Uh, at that moment. So without using up too much time here really with the welcome and introduction, I'd rather hand it over to Matt Franzak to introduce our keynote speaker and get rolling for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, I, I appreciate your remarks. Folks, I'm privileged to introduce our keynote speaker, the FAA administrator and um, my former Delta colleague, Captain Steve Dixon. Um, when he first took over Delta Flight Ops in 2007, Delta was emerging from bankruptcy and I had recently transitioned from a management position in flight control uh, to a line ATC coordinator position. And at that time, Steve was my boss's 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 boss or something. Like that. Um, because I was no longer in flight control management, Steve and I didn't really have a chance to develop the type of working relationship I think we would have uh, had I still been part of the flight control management team. Uh, and therefore, we did not have to overcome the fact that he was a zoomie and I was a squid. But in any event, that still is out there for all to know. 
nonetheless, um, I, I did observe him for those last two years of my Delta career and, and subsequently as I transitioned to life after Delta. And frankly, I was pleased both with what I saw in terms of Delta's success and didn't see or hear, i.e. lots of Delta pilot angst, and I know a couple of them very, very well. Um, several events took place in Steve's uh, 12 or so years of leading Delta's flight ops organization that I think are very much worth relating. Um, the Delta Northwest merger consummated in October 2008 um, has been called a textbook example of how to combine two airlines. It went this way in no small part, I am sure, due to Steve's leadership, his guidance, and his tenacity. And if you've never been involved in combining airlines, and I did it twice with Western and Pan Am, all I can say is that contrary to what the financial analysts say, few tasks are more difficult, more contentious, or more full of pitfalls. Um, Steve was a, a hands-on kind of industry technical leader while at Delta. He was the chairman of the IATA Ops Committee. He was the chair of the Air Traffic Management Advisory Committee, known as ATMAC, and also the Next Gen Implementation Task Force, commonly known as Task Force 5. He understands very well how the pieces and parts of the NASA, including aviation weather information, interact with one another. And speaking of aviation weather, Steve was always a strong proponent of it while at Delta. And I'm pretty sure that was in part based on his own experiences as a T-38 F-15, Boeing 727, 737, 757, and 767, and for reasons that are unclear to me, A320 pilot. Uh, perhaps the most telling comment, though, that I found with regards to Steve's flight ops leadership at Delta came from the Delta channel in the Airline Pilot Forum online blog. And in case you are not aware, Pilots tend to speak their minds about everything and anything, whether it's in person or in blogs. The anonymous to me pilot commenter, who I am reasonably certain was too old to be Steve, wrote, and I quote, frankly, Steve Dixon is probably the most forthright and talented flight ops leader we've had since pre-ball. Now, in case you've not heard of him, Thomas Prelo pre-ball was Delta's VP of flight operations in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and the chief pilot for several decades before that. According to the comments that the Georgia Aviation Hall of Fame wrote about pre-ball, quote, few have been so revered by the pilots with whom he worked for his honesty, his fairness, and support, and Pre's reputation as a trailblazer in commercial aviation was legendary. Being compared to him is a heck of a compliment, and, and to boot, it came from a crusty old cynical pilot. In October 2018, Steve retired from Delta after a highly successful 27-year career. Being a young man, however, he decided to take on one more small challenge. And in July of 2019, Steve was sworn in as administrator of the FAA. I believe we're gonna be saying the same things about Steve's performance as FAA administrator that Captain Krusty said about Steve's time at Delta. Um, ladies and gentlemen, so without any further ado, please welcome the FAA Administrator, Captain Steve Dixon. Well, thanks, Matt. Um, first of all, let's do a sound check. Can you guys hear me okay? Five by five. Great. Well, I'll try to live up to the words. I think some of them might be true, but uh, um, as I heard uh, someone more a few minutes ago, I'm joining you in this environment in uh, pandemic casual, FAA pandemic casual here. Um, and this is my first time actually using um, Microsoft Teams. So hopefully this will this will come across OK. We've actually been using uh, the government version of, uh, of Zoom. And uh, the FAA right now is doing about 1500 Zoom meetings a day. I've, I've had anywhere from five to eight myself. So uh, we've been able to function uh, in this environment extremely well, um, worked a lot of uh, a lot of issues for the benefit of the industry and very difficult circumstances. So, uh, but I want to really start out by thanking Matt for his kind words and also Matthias and, uh, and Dave Strand for their invitation to uh, spend some time with you today. Um, I think this is your first virtual meeting in 24 years. So, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, this is going to, as it is for a lot of uh, a lot of organizations, 
uh, actually create some opportunities for uh, for collaboration, working together uh, in different ways than than uh, that we didn't really think about so much before. I know that there's some opportunities here at the agency. For example, I've got uh, 34 locations here inside the District of Columbia, and uh, there are times when folks have to come into the building for a 30 minute or an hour long meeting and you think of all that transit time and uh, I know that we'll be using tools like this going forward to make ourselves more effective and uh, be able to conduct uh, outreach even here within the Washington area um, a lot more dynamically. Um, you know, as Matt said, we shared some some challenging times together. Um, but out of these challenges, uh, like we're all going through right now, uh, there's tremendous opportunities. And I think something, uh, you know, that that uh, we're, as we're going through this whole COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, we wouldn't have thought about anything like this in our lifetimes, you know, would happen. And uh, the impact that we're seeing on the industry that we all love so much. Um, pandemics were something that I remember reading about in the history books. And, uh, you know, we've had a few. We had SARS back in the early 2000s. We've had H1N1. Um, you know, we've had Ebola, but nothing like the, the challenges that we're facing today. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be with you. You know, out of any crisis comes a lot of opportunity, uh, if you look at it in a, in a positive way. And I think one of the opportunities, frankly, is for all of us to be together uh, today and for me to be able to spend some time with you. So that's something that I value very much. Um, you know, given the convective weather that's lasted through the DC area over the past few days, actually it's a beautiful day today, but uh, having a virtual meeting with where folks didn't have to travel in uh, with some pretty difficult weather last night actually ended up maybe being a pretty good thing. Um, and of course, when it comes to a topic like this, you know, it's better to be able to get together virtually than than not at all. Um, as I said a moment ago, this crisis is forcing us to find new ways to get the job done and to collaborate and focus on things like safety. Uh, and that's actually a good thing. You know, at the agency, we've had a number of very important events where we bring the, the industry together uh, be canceled or postponed over the last few weeks. Uh, the uh, InfoShare meeting is uh, is a good example. And, uh, so we're we are actually going to be conducting an aviation safety town hall here to make sure that we can continue to reach out uh, to the not only the commercial carriers but the manufacturers and all segments of of aviation because one of the uh, most important things about what we do at the agency, really the most the most important thing is continuing to be the gold standard in the world for aviation safety. So um, I'm happy to spend some time with you guys this morning, uh, talk a little bit about my own weather experiences, um, uh, like several others uh, that I know are, are online here. I spent most of my, my time uh, as a student of the weather from the, uh, from the front seat, from the left seat of, uh, in the cockpit of a commercial airplane or a single seat fighter. And, uh, you know, when it comes to weather forecasting, one of my favorite quotes is from Yogi Berra. And uh, Yogi once said, predictions are really hard to make, especially about the future. So, uh, you know, the, the just to keep in mind, uh, you know, the challenges that we have had, even predicting where we would be uh, a couple of months ago now, I don't think any of us thought that we'd be having this meeting uh, in this way. But again, it's, a, it's, it's creating opportunities for us to continue to work together effectively, and that's, that's really important. Um, like all the pilots among us, um, I've got a lot of respect for uh, er, the work that you have done and the work that everyone in the weather space um, has done over the years. Uh, you know, obviously, particularly when it comes to, to uh, areas that can disrupt airline operations uh, in particular, uh, thunderstorms, hurricanes, those things you want to admire from a distance. Um, I remember someone once said a thunderstorm is never as bad on the outside as it appears or on the inside as it appears on the outside. It's actually worse. And I also remember a sign that I saw down in uh, base ops uh, down at uh, Davis Monthan Air Force Base when I was down there 
uh, with the uh, when I was in the F-15 at Holloman, uh, we were doing a little deployment down there with the A-10s and they had a sign uh, over the ops desk that said there's no reason to fly through a thunderstorm in peacetime. So good uh, safety tip for everybody. Uh, but we all know the reality. We have to we usually have to fly whenever and whenever it's safe to do so. And that means we have to fly in weather of all kinds. Uh, we have to manage the operation around that. And to make that flying as safe and efficient as we possibly can, we've got to have the right data and the right tools. And that's why FPAW has been coming together uh, since 1979 to advocate for better aviation weather through effective science, research and development and implementation. And so my hat's off to everything uh, that you have been able to do. Um, I'll share a few of my experiences with weather during my military and civilian flying careers, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the FAA's efforts to improve aviation weather. Um, certainly, when I was flying F-15s, you know, the uh, you know in, in the military environment, particularly in a single seat fighter, you really relied on your uh, uh, we we affectionately called them weather guessers at the time to uh, to give you an accurate weather forecast. I remember one time. We were we would uh, when I was in Bitburg, Germany, some of the worst uh, weather that you would have uh, anywhere in the world and uh, uh, in Central Europe. And we would go for weeks where you wouldn't get above, you know, probably 100 meters, visibil 100 meters visibility and 100 foot ceiling. And uh, we were on a deployment down to uh, Dutch Mamano in the Mediterranean and uh, trying to swap out airplanes. And I was leading a four ship. And we had had to cancel weather cancel uh, three days in a row because we just never had a legal alternate. And finally, we ended up in a situation where uh, we had an alternate over at Lakenheath in the UK. It was the closest alternate we had. So we blasted off, got to about two thirds of the way up there, really past the point of no return. And uh, fog bank started to roll in at our destination. So I'd, we had to, bit, uh, to divert from Bitburg over to Hahn and uh, as I was coming up initial with a four ship of F-15s, the fog bank was at the end of the runway and began to envelop the tower and they, they closed the runway. And I had to declare an emergency to land. And uh, so we got on the ground and the airplanes ended up sitting there for almost a week after that to get, re, uh, to get back over uh, to a home base. Um, of course, you know, running flight ops at Delta, uh, I think we uh, over the over my tenure, uh, we became more and more uh, more and more data driven and had uh, I think higher and higher fidelity uh, weather products that we would use uh, to make decisions. We became known for being the uh, uh, you know among the the first carriers to uh, really think about how we would. Uh, thin the schedule to keep make sure we didn't have uh, passengers spending the night in the airport, keep them away from the airport, but also be among the first to start up. Um, and I, I think we, I was really proud of the in-house weather shop that we had. We did not contract out our metro function, uh, as you had seen in, in some other areas. Not that that can't be effective, but uh, but I think it certainly was an integral part of our of our decision making team. Um, I heard Bill Watts on the line. Uh, as well, and of course, uh, many of you know have known Bill for a long time. He was instrumental working with uh, a lot of folks uh, at the company to help synthesize uh, the presentation of weather information in the flight deck, which has been uh, challenging over the decades. And we're getting to to uh, uh, an environment where weather information is presented just in time uh, to pilots and less and less in textual form and more in ways that's uh, uh, in, in a way that uh, that can have actually help drive operational decision making on the flight deck, and that's uh, that's gonna, that's helping us, I think, uh, add to our margin of safety and, and being more resilient um, as operators. Of course, now at the FAA, I'm overseeing a broad uh, portfolio of key weather safety research, development, and implementation projects and programs. At the system level. One large project that you'll be hearing a lot more about in the near future is called Weather Community of Interest or COI. And it's an effort to better communicate and share weather information across all FAA organizations and to break down the silos of excellence that we sometimes have within the agency. Now, along with developing more optimal methods for exchanging weather information, 
and resolving mission-specific weather challenges. The COI will also promote communication and collaboration between the FAA, other federal agencies, industry and international partners uh, to ensure appropriate access to and availability and consistency of weather information. The core weather COI team, which includes David and Matt from MITRE and some of my FAA people, uh, Bill Bauman, uh, Alfred uh, Musakanian, and uh, Marilyn Pearson, they've been drafting a charter and they are, they're assessing potential participation and targeting mid-July for their first meeting. At the research level, of course, we have a lot going on. We've got a large and comprehensive slate of projects underway or recently implemented. One product is called Offshore Precipitation Capability, or OPC. It creates a NEXRAD-like weather picture using machine learning techniques and data from GOES satellites, global uh, lightning strike networks, and numerical weather prediction models. We saw the value of the system back in 2017 when Hurricane Maria wiped out the NEXRAD radar in Puerto Rico, and OPC was able to provide the next best thing for first responders. Another satellite-based weather technology is called ROMEO, which stands for Remote Oceanic Meteorology Information Operational Demonstration. This is a proof of concept tool that can deliver near real-time real observations of thunderstorm complexities and cloud top heights. American, Delta, and United have been testing it as a NextRad-like tool to augment onboard radar and convective hotspots, such as the intertropical conver convergence zone. And to help avoid clear air and mountain wave, tur wave turbulence, we developed and deployed the graphical turbulence guidance to provide operators with high resolution, gridded global detection forecasts, along with a new graphical turbulence guidance now cast that updates every 15 minutes based on new pilot reports and other data, something very near and dear to my heart. And that's just a sampling of the myriad programs we're working. As you can see that we're very engaged at the agency. So again, thanks to all of you for the invite, uh, specifically uh, Matt, Matthias, and and uh, and David. I really appreciate it. Value the uh, relationships uh, very much. Please know that we're very grateful for all the work that uh, FPA does. And uh, again, this uh, you know, from my seat, um, you know, as FAA administrator, please know I'm fully aware of the critical role that aviation weather has on the safety, efficiency, and health of our very precious national airspace system. And uh, so, you know, look forward to living to fight another day here. Uh, we're keeping the system running uh, so that it's ready when our, uh, when our airlines and our, our nation uh, recovers from the current crisis. Uh, I think you'd be very proud of, of everything that's going on uh, among the professional workforce here at the agency. Everybody's been doing a, a really fantastic job. So. Again, appreciate the invitation and the chance to spend a few minutes with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Matthias, any additional comments, my friend? No, this was a wonderful uh, welcome and keynote for setting the stage for FPA. We truly appreciate, Steve, that you made the time to speak to us this morning and uh, we hope to have many more opportunities of this uh, nature to engage you with FPA one way or another. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. And appreciate all of your leadership and, uh, and dedication very much and look forward to seeing you again soon. Hopefully in person. All right, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you.